How y'all doing? Uh, so I came from a background with just me, my mom, and my brother. My dad was never in the picture. Uh, so right off the bat, that was kind of like a uh, hard thing for me to accept why he was never there. Uh, but throughout my childhood, we spent a lot of time with my grandparents, and there was a lot of verbal abuse. Um, I was called a lot of things, like I was unwanted, unloved, I couldn't do anything or amount to anything, and I allowed that to become my identity, I believe that. And uh, so I didn't really have any high expectations for myself. Uh, I never really thought that I could do anything for anybody or be accepted anywhere. And uh, at the age of 10 to 16, I was sexually abused by four men, and three of them were family members. And uh, that uh, was where a lot of my damage came from. I felt like my voice was taken, my childhood was taken. Uh, and then I had nothing left. So I would lock myself in my bedroom. I wouldn't talk to anybody. I didn't know how to socialize anymore. Um, between that time, the age of 14, I was introduced to uh, uh, drugs and alcohol. And I used that as a social way to feel like I had a voice to that fake that fine, to have that smile, to make me look like I was normal. And um, it quickly progressed because nothing could cover that spot that was inside of me. And I knew I knew about Jesus. I've been to church and I've heard about him, but I didn't want to accept him because I felt like he was going to hurt me just like any other man has in my life. And um, I had a really distorted figure of a father because mine wasn't in my life and the man in my life. And um, I went through Teen Challenge for a whole year and um, it did good. I learned about my identity and who I was and everything, but I just, I faked through it. I didn't put my whole heart into it and I learned a lot of head knowledge, but it wasn't going to my heart. And um, so I came to family care where I finally made the decision in my heart that I was gonna find a way to get this whole filled the right way. Amen. And, um, I learned who I was, I learned the truth, and I learned how to get it from my head to my heart. I learned that head knowledge won't get you very far. You can spit out verses all day long, but it's when you get it in your heart and when you apply it to your life, when you live it out, that's where life change comes. And uh, that's what I really learned in family care is that only Jesus can fill that spot and that void inside of me, and that he's not the man that I thought that he was. He doesn't disown me. He doesn't leave me. He, he'll promise to never forsake me. And I thank God that I can stand on his promises, Amen. that he is truthful, that he is loving, non judgmental. And I love God. Like, he is my lover. He is my father. He's my best friend. He is my savior. He's my everything. And I believe now that my identity is that I am redeemed. I am loved. I am accepted. Amen. You know, and that I can go anywhere. And I can share the gospel, I can share the gospel with everybody, and I can be my true self and know that I'm accepted. And even if mankind doesn't love me and I will be an outcast because I'm with God, I'm okay with that because God's all that I want. Amen. 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 Woo! Praise the Lord. Second Corinthians 5 17 says that anyone, I said anyone who comes to Christ is a new creation. It said, old things pass away, and behold, all things become new. That's what we stand on. You know, we don't sit in a circle of family care and say, you have to identify by your failures, by your choices. You're always going to be an addict. We say that God can transform your life and make you somebody totally new, brand new. He doesn't do a renovation. He doesn't make the best of what he's got. He tears everything down and rebuilds you brand new. Amen. I'm seeing that happen. Alan, come over here real quick. My buddy Alan, man, is from down in Virginia. You're going to hear it when he talks. <laughs> uh, but, man, this is the first time he's ever, that I know of, shared his testimony publicly in a church like this. But, man, I just feel like this is the right place for him to do it. It feels like home, man. And the word of God says in Revelation that we're made overcomers by the blood of the Lamb. And that's been applied. But it says by the word of our testimony. So not everybody has a big mouth like I do, man. So y'all pray. But I'm believing that as he shares his story like this, there's something in the spiritual is happening big that's causing him to be more of an overcomer than he's already been, man. So, Alan, share real quick what God's done in your life. Well, God's laid it on my heart to say howdy. 
Howdy. <laughs> I've uh, battled a life of uh, addiction and incarceration for at least 20 years, the biggest part of my life. Uh, I give my life to God in uh, July 18, 2014. I was incarcerated. Uh, I came home 2019. Uh, I, I knew what I had to do. I, I didn't. I didn't get it right again. Uh, uh, I left. I came to Ohio. I left the state of Virginia. I've met these people here, Josh and his wife and family, and everybody I've met around them, Mr. Goodman, his family, and his Bible studies. Uh, God has just uh, done a tremendous job, transformed me. Uh, I never thought I'd have a chance, but now I'm not only out of addiction, I'm coming off probation. Amen. I've got a new life, getting my children back. Yes, sir. Amen. And, uh, we get I love Jesus. <laughs> Oh, that's all it takes. He said, just stand firm in him. And uh, I don't have to fight no battles. He'll take care of all of them. Yeah. Yeah. He surely has. Amen. So thank you, God. Amen. Amen. Praise God. You know, you, you know what? It's real when you go through the trials. And, and Dave and Jody have been walking with Alan very closely as well, man. And, but, but Alan, he had some stuff that, that came to bite him a little bit. And, and not too long ago, he was in jail down in Virginia, about six, seven hours from all of his family up here. Right, his church family, his, his family of the redeemed, man. And, and he got to go down there, and I got to drive down and, and pick him up from jail. And the most amazing thing is he's telling people about Jesus in a jail cell. He's leading people to Jesus. There could have been a bitterness and an anger in him, but, man, he was there, and, and he's talking to young people about it. Man, that's how you know that it's real. Something stirs in you where you just can't help but tell it. And I praise God for that. Brittany, come real quick and share what God's doing in your life. Well, um, I was addicted to heroin for two years. I was dating the guy that got me on it, and after that, it just downward spiraled. I lost my dad a month after using, and I lost him to suicide. So after I lost him, I became more addicted, and I failed four drug tests on the way, and I got put in jail. After I got out of jail, I started using more because I realized there was no point in to just stop and quit. I just figured my life was over and I was already an addict, so why not? So um, I overdosed three days after my birthday and was rushed to the hospital. And if I wouldn't have got there, I would have been dead. I was blue in the face. I only had two minutes left to live. And after that, I got out, I started meeting with Alicia, and I came to the Freedom Home, gave my heart to Jesus. Amen. And it's just been all good after that. I graduated the program, and I'm an intern at Family Care Ministries now, and I've never been happier. Amen. Praise God. Praise God, man. Well, I get the privilege of seeing these individuals before they come to Christ a lot of times. And I'm telling you what, man, uh, not, not physically ugly, but there's an ugliness that comes with that life of sin. There's an ugliness that comes with addiction. And I get to see God make beauty uh, from ashes. I get to see God turn this morning into gladness. And I absolutely love it. But the word that was stirring on my heart was, was let God arise. And I'm thinking about my life last night. And I'm thinking about July 20th, 2005. Right? And I was a miserable heroin addict at that point. And I remember pulling my car over to the side of the road about 7 in the morning because that's what I did. That was I, I, I shot heroin to eat, to sleep, to breathe, to function, to have a, communi have a conversation with you. That was my life. 30 times a day, I'd be putting a needle in my arm, shooting heroin, man. And my dad's a preacher. My grandfather's a preacher. I grew up in the house of God. I knew better. I played drums on the praise team. Then I got bashful, so I started running the sound because I didn't want to be up front, man. But I knew it. I want you to hear that. I knew it. I had this head knowledge about this man named Jesus. I could finish the sentences for you. When I went to jail and went to classes, they would say, how do you know you're forgiven? And the people that were there would start to use these big, huge words about deity and all this stuff. And nobody understood what they were saying, and I would tell them. And the Bible says if you ask for forgiveness, he's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you. And they said, how are you here? I said, well, I, I don't live it. I just know it. 
And I'm afraid that's the state of a lot of the churches that I go to, man. There's, there's, there's defeat and there's dysfunction and there's discord and there's disunity. But we get to a place where no different than people say, how do you, how do you even start with a life that's been so broken? It's been so messed up. You've just heard a little tiny taste of a day or two in the life of 20 some years of addiction. Right? You just heard a little bit of it. So so what do you what do you do, man? You have to get to a place where your heart's cry is let God arise and let his enemies be scattered. Let God arise in this life and let her see that there's something greater than this thing that's taken her innocence and her identity. And you get them away from this drugs and alcohol. And let me tell you what, after that. They're just like everyone else in the church. They have issues. They have struggles. They get they get offended. They have these deep gaping wounds. And a lot of times, behind that Sunday smile, behind that dress up nice, and there's some hurting people. A lot of times we're not willing to admit that and, and cry out and say, you know what, God? We're going to humble ourselves and say, let you arise and let your enemies be scattered. But I pulled over to the side of the road. I filled a syringe up with heroin. I put it into my arm right here. I'll never forget it, man, into my left arm. And, and I got back behind the wheel of that car, and I started driving down the road. I've done this for years, thousands of times, right? And this year, for some reason, was different. And I nodded out behind the wheel, and, and when I woke up, I was in oncoming traffic on the highway. And I remember I was about to hit their guardrail on the other side, and, and so I just swerved real quick. When I swerved, I swerved right into oncoming traffic and hit another vehicle head on, probably going about 60 miles an hour. And I felt this impact like I've never felt in my life, man. I don't even know how to describe it. But when I came to the airbag dust, I don't know if you've ever been in a car wreck and your airbag deploys, there's like a sulfur smell. It burns your nose. And I couldn't get away from it. And I'm trying to, to get my head away from that smell. And, and, and I'm, I'm trying to get out of the car. I, I totaled six cars that year. Six this is just the seventh, and I'm trying to get out of the car like I had so many times, but my body wouldn't move, and I couldn't figure out why. I looked down. I was looking at the tread of my shoe. My leg was completely backwards, and I'm looking at the bottom of my foot. I knew I was in trouble. This leg was about four inches shorter, if you can believe that. That means my thigh disappeared. <laughs> This leg was about four inches shorter because it blew my hip out and, and my back out. My shoulder was crushed. My ankle, my knee, both my shins. I was crushed from the waist down in my shoulder. And they get there with the jaws of life. And they're cutting my car in half. And they're cutting the door off. And life flight helicopters land. And it seems like something out of, a, out of an episode of Cops that I've seen. And they pull me out of this car and they put this rubber thing in my mouth and they say, man, you're going to have to bite down. And they life like me to this hospital in Pittsburgh, Allegheny General. Man, and I'm there and they start doing all these surgeries and I'm going out and coming back and, and, and I'm going out and coming back and I find out I am a mess. They said, your hip isn't broken. It's in hundreds and hundreds of pieces. It has exploded. Your ankle has exploded. And they, 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 they send me home after all these surgeries with the belief this is going to be my life, right? I'm going to be a miserable drug addict. Now I'm going to be prescribed everything you could possibly think of under the sun. And I'm going to go home and they said, if your family, if you're lucky, your family can get up under your arms and pick you up and sit you at the dinner table and you can have dinner with them. And for about a year, I was in a wheelchair and I was in a hospital bed in the living room and, and I was so broken and I was so lost and I was so hurting and I would think, God, how did I get here? How did I go from youth camps and seeing moves of God? How was I around it? But I didn't experience it in a way where it changed my life. You know, you can hang around the altar or you can lay on the altar. Look at the story of Elijah and the prophets of Baal. A lot of them, 450 to 1 outnumbered. And some of them were hanging around the altar and God didn't move. But Elijah laid on his face at the altar and cried out in a sense, let God arise. Let my enemies be scattered and God answered by fire. And I'm telling us, God wants to do the same thing today. Where do you start when somebody's broken and hurting? How do you take somebody like me and even start when you got 32 years of prison over your head? I had three cases coming against me in different states. I was in this car wreck now and wasn't supposed to, 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 to be walking. Man, I'm, I'm a burden now on my family. And, and, and man, what do you do? 
You got to believe that we serve a big God to handle some big problems. You got your view of God has to grow tremendously to believe that when you reach your hands out to heaven and sing holy, that God's going to come from his throne and he's going to fill his room with his presence and he's going to transform your life. To be honest with you, church is kind of boring without that. This was about coming and sitting and staring at you, Matt. Man, I, 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 I'd be in a position where I'd say, let's meet at four and have wings. <laughs> Might as well make it meaningful, man. Right? But I've come here, and the reason that we do what we do is because we need to see a move of God. We need to see God arise and scatter the enemies, man. It's one of the best promises in the Bible. And let me read it to you. Psalm 68, verses 1. I'm going to read through 1 through 4. Let God arise. Let his enemies be scattered. Let those also who hate him flee before him. As smoke is driven away, so drive them away. As wax melts before the fire, so let the wicked perish at the presence of God. But let the righteous be glad. Let them rejoice before God. Yes, let them rejoice exceedingly. Y'all hear that right there. And I don't want to hear a golf clap next time. It says, let us rejoice exceedingly, man. Sing to God. Sing praises to his name. Extol him who rides on the clouds by his name, Yah, and rejoice before him. It's one of the most awesome promises in the Bible that we have. This is what God promised to do in difficult times. Would you say we're living in a difficult time? Amen. This is what God promised to do in difficult times. is scatter his enemies, man. This is, this is the song that the martyrs were singing. When they went to the furnace, when, when they were getting crucified for Jesus, this is the song that they were singing. In essence, let God arise. God, you, you, you deliver me. Even if you don't, God, we're going to serve you anyway. Yeah. Go with me. Amen. He says, we're going to serve you anyway, man. And in every generation, I can find where God has risen on behalf of his people. In every generation, I can find where God has raised up and done a mighty work, man. You can look all through the word of God. You can look in my life. You can look at my wife's life. We didn't get to testify. I should put her on the spot, but I'm not going to do that to her, man. <laughs> But from a heroin addict, from somebody that was selling drugs and messed up and, and didn't have that, that, that amazing family that was bringing her up into things of God. Her family's amazing, but they weren't bringing her up into things of God. And, and man, where she went to, the place when I met her said, this is the biggest turnaround I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> you got to meet her. And I'm like, I'm good. <laughs> and then she seen me and she couldn't help my... My good look, she couldn't help but just cling to me. Praise God. Man, I'm the lucky one. I'm the one that got blessed for sure. But in every generation, God has moved on behalf of his people. In the beginning of this chapter is a quote of words that Moses used as a cloud was leading them. Right? And it was leading them. They held up the Ark of the Covenant. They held it up in the air. And, and before they started, he cried these words, let God arise. They held up the mercy seat. They held up the ark. They held it up in the air. And they began to cry out, let God arise. There was a tremendous need and God rose. We know that from reading this story right here, man. Where there was a need for the people of God. He always arises and he always answers. I'm not talking about name it, claim it, blab it, grab it. I don't mean that. I can say anything. I'm going to pray for that Cadillac and God's going to give it to me. I'll take it. If he gives it to me. But I'm talking about depending on the promises of God in my life in a spiritual sense. And say, God, when I'm bogged down, when all hell's coming against me, when depression arises, when all these things happen, you're going to have to arise in my life and let the enemies be scattered. How many of y'all know, man, when it, when, when, when it rains, it pours? You ever hear that saying? What about James when it says, my brethren, count it all joy when... You fall into various trials, right? Usually when one comes, they come all of them, man. Because Satan's slick and he knows where to get us. That's where we have to begin to cry out. God, you will rise and let these enemies be scattered, man. Where there's a need, God will rise. I promise you that. But there's an attack on our churches right now. Somebody better say amen. amen. There's an attack on our communities right now. There's an attack on people. There's an attack on our schools, on our kids. And Satan is trying to destroy every Christian witness. 
in our communities. More than I've ever seen it in 14 years of doing what I'm doing. Satan right now more than ever is trying to destroy the Christian witness. Right? He's trying to destroy the works of God. He's trying to get our focus where we don't come up here and have this great move of God and see a demonstration of the power of God. Paul said, it ain't my fancy words that's going to do anything. It's the demonstration and the power of the Spirit of God that's moving. It's going to cause people to believe. And it stirs us up for the things of God. Praise the Lord, man. I'm, and I thank you, man, for responding to that. Because I can say anything I want and God can speak. But if we don't respond, he's a perfect gentleman. But I'm believing for your freedom. I'm believing that your life's going to be different because there was a need and we cried out. But Satan is trying and there's horrible, unspeakable things that are happening all around us. I get to go with the police and we get to respond down to the police station. And Brother Dave got to come with me the other day. When a guy's handcuffed to the bench and the police calls us and say, hey, I need you to come over and give this person hope they're really broken. So we get to go over while they're handcuffed to the bench, waiting to go to the jail, and we get to give them Jesus. And we get to tell them that there's hope for them. And God, in the midst of being handcuffed to a bench, God can arise and they can be set free. We've seen so many saved handcuffed to a bench. Man, and they've started their new life and something started to change. But Satan knows his time is short. I don't give him no credit at all. But he knows his time is short. So you better believe he's going to fight and try to try to destroy our witness. And he's attacking churches and, and its members who are taking a stand. That remnant of grace, those people that are walking for God. Satan is coming against them. But my Bible says that God will arise. There's an about to be an education given to Satan. Because I'm dumb enough to believe the word of God. I'm dumb enough to believe the spirit of God. And when I read it and when he speaks it, we operate in it. And when we do that, man, we begin to see a move like we've not seen before. I'm praying and I believe the Lord has showed me this. There's a revival about to take place amongst the valleys. There's a revival about to take place. But it's going to start with this. And ma'am, I told you this when you were up here. It's going to start with the people of God repenting. Hearing me right now. It's going to start with the people of God being transparent enough to say, you know what, I'm not perfect. You know what, I have some issues going on. You know what, there's some things that I'm not doing heroin, I'm not doing that. But, but man, there's some things in my life and I need to come up before the presence of God and make it right. And I believe that God just showed me even when we were sitting in here. When we begin to do that as the children of God, God will begin to set a fire ablaze in our hearts and in our spirits. And he's going to heal these wounds that we have as the body of Christ. We don't have to walk around damaged or, or unaffected anymore. God says he's raising up. He's raising up a generation. He's raising up a, 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 a reviving. He's stirring us up. But we have to be willing, man. We have to be willing when the forces of hell, when Satan came against the prophet Elijah, he was one man, one prophet of God. And his servant said this when they were in the city and the army came to surround him and attack him. His servant said, my master, he said, alas, my master, where shall we do? It's, it's worded weird in my Bible because what he's saying is we need to get out of here. Where do we go and what do we do? He was saying both. He's panicking. This was a new, a new servant of Elijah. And he didn't fully know what Elijah was capable of yet as he served God. The former servant was a wicked man and, and, and he wasn't there anymore. As we know, I won't get into that whole story. But how could Elijah be at peace? You have a whole army that's surrounding the city and they're there for you. One man. You and your servant, they're there to take you out, man. But Elijah was sitting there in peace because he knows that God has arisen and the mountains were filled with the armies of God. The mountains were filled with the presence of God. The mountains were filled and he said, hold on a second. Lord, let me pray. Open his eyes so that he can see. And his eyes were opened, it says, and he looked out there and he all of a sudden saw that those that were for them were more than those that were against them. And when we can see through that perspective, man, we keep we keep things in alignment where we need to be and we'll serve God and cry out to God the way that we need to. I don't understand why, but in today's day and age, it seems like the altar is becoming a thing of the past. 
People don't want to come to the altar. They're scared to death that someone might say something bad about them or someone might think that they're a sinner or let me tell you something. Every one of us were made out of dirt. So it's okay to look at somebody and say, look, you're just a dirt bag. <laughs> this is the one time that you can call a preacher a dirt bag. Go ahead, you call me a dirt bag. You're made out of the dirt. That's a humble every single one of us, man. We were made out of the dirt. So when we come to this and we say, God, you're moving on our behalf and we ain't nothing in ourselves. But when we cry out to you, when we repair the horns of the altar that they used to grab hold of because they would pray so fervently. When we repair those horns of the altar, God will begin to move. Those Wednesday night prayer meetings are going to spark a reviving. But I also believe this again. It's going to start with repentance. I want you to hear me this morning. I want you to hear that strongly. It's going to start with don't think about nobody else. Think about you. It's going to start with repentance. God, anything that's in my heart, man. Jesus, forgive me. Man, Eliza's sitting in peace because he knows the army of God is around him. The same army that was there that day is with us right now. I want you to get that in your spirit, man. The same army that was there that day that surrounded the city that gave this man encouragement when he's outnumbered by thousands. That same army is around this church building. That same army is around our school system. That same army is around our communities that are, that are drug addicted. I want you to hear this. More people died in one year from drug overdoses than all of the Vietnam War combined. Think about the years that Vietnam went, went on. I wasn't around yet. But man, if you think, if you put that into perspective, the number of people who died in this war... More people died in one year from drug overdoses than all of the Vietnam War combined. I got to speak at a national stage and they called us the armpit of the U.S., this area. The stripes, that area right here. They said, you're the armpit of the U.S. I'm competitive. I don't like to lose at anything. Thumb wrestling with my kids. I'm beating you. Checkers. No participation trophies in this house. Man. We're competitive. We like to have fun, man. So when they stood up there and the United States Surgeon General said, this is the armpit of the U.S. where I live, where God's called me to. He said, this is the armpit. And I believed in that place. I, I, was, I wasn't offended. I was stirred. And I said, God, you're going to have to do away with this PowerPoint because I don't want to do it. And I'll be honest with you, the computer started messing up. The director of the FBI was speaking and the computer messed up. She didn't have nothing to say without a PowerPoint. So I went over to the guy, said to the media guy, I said, listen, scrap mine. I'll just speak from my heart and you can get it ready for the next. He's like, are you serious? I'm serious. Thank you, Jesus, for screwing up this thing. And I got to get up there and I said, you know what? I've heard these statistics. I've seen the doom and gloom. I know two Boeing 747 airplanes, if they would crash and everybody on board would die, we would take notice. That's how many people die every day of drug overdoses. It'd be like two Boeing 747s full of people wrecking and burning up every single day. That's amazing. And I'm talking about judges. I'm talking about police officers. I'm talking about people in the alleys, people in our school system, kids as young as 10 years old that I've seen overdose and die from Oxycontin and alcohol, man. It's a thing where I don't have a choice but to say, God, you arise and let your enemies be scattered because I can't handle another young person dying and going to hell without the people of God standing up and saying there's an army and they're dressed for battle. Y'all with me? There's an army and they're dressed for battle, man. The same army is right here where God's people are. So the battle is already won. I said the battle is already won. He is with us in this drug addiction. He is with us in these hard times. He's right here, man. And, and, and we have to believe that. In verse 12, if you look at 1 Kings, that story of Elijah, it said kings of armies fled and ran. And see, the church, the church that carried it home divided the spoils. And it says, and the smoke is driven away. In verse 2, drive them away. The smoke is driven away. We can't get into these battles unless we're singing a song of triumph. We can't get into these battles unless we come with a posture that, listen, I'm victorious, right? I'm no match for the enemy in myself. But the Bible says greater is he that is in me that is in you than he that is in the world. 
right? So that's my ability that I have from the truth of God's word to say I'm coming into this battle no matter what it looks like and I'm coming victorious. When I met Willow, I didn't say, Willow, this is a hard case. I don't know what I'm going to do for you. Oh, man, you've been abused. I, don't, I can't understand that. Man, you've been through programs and, and, and you can't find an answer and you keep, I, I don't understand that, Willow. No, I came to you and I said, you can be set free. You can have the same life that I have. You can be a spiritual giant. You can become a prayer warrior. You can sense the presence of God. You can be filled with the Holy Ghost. And you can be absolutely different. That story of this little girl that was abused will start to sound like a story of somebody you used to know. Because God will transform your heart and your mind so much. But he'll do it for you as well. So when I come into a church, that's my attitude is, God, we're victorious. The battle is already won. What are we facing today as a church body? What are we facing today as individuals, as families? The battle's been won. You say, Josh, but you don't understand my situation. I don't, but God does. Amen. And the battle's been won. And the smoke has been driven away. We got to see the strongholds of Satan are nothing but wax. You hearing that? I said they're nothing but wax. And those strongholds melt like wax near a candle when we come singing and believing this psalm and the power of God is working for us. When I come into this church. And I can come in here and I can become to worship and I can begin to praise God. It says that those strongholds will melt like wax before the Lord. I don't know about you, but I don't want anything in my life that's not of God. I don't want anything that I don't I don't want to let anything in here that's not of God. So when I have strongholds and I struggle and bitterness creeps in, how many's ever been hurt by words of somebody? And you have trouble forgiving. Two people, thank y'all, praise the Lord. <laughs> and you have trouble forgiving, man. It says when you come into the house of God, when you come in with a victorious mindset, and you'll come up in his presence, and, and no one, it was just like when that Ark of the Covenant was lifted up, and they begin to praise God. Wax, it, their, their strongholds melted like wax before the Lord. There's no effort in melting wax. You hold it next to the fire and it melts and it goes away. That's what can happen in your life. That's what can continue to happen in my life. And this is the way that we have to believe in our minds, man. There's a smoke, the chapter says. And, and when Jesus comes on the scene, the smoke disappears. How do you know if Jesus is on the scene? Because the smoke disappeared. What is that false doctrine? It's smoke. When Jesus comes on the scene, that false doctrine disappears and truth prevails. Unbiblical teaching is smoke, discord, smoke. And when Jesus comes into the picture, that smoke has to melt like wax before the Lord. This unity, man, pride, that smoke. So when I come up to the presence of God and I say, Jesus, you be glorified. You do in my life what you want to do. That smoke begins to go. It becomes to melt away. Sometimes we, we put on a show in church. You ever been guilty of that? Just me again. <laughs> I think I got a screen I can see back there. I'm preaching to myself right now. <laughs> Man, but we get to these places sometimes, man, where, where man, we, we, we come to church and behind that smile, you're really hurting. Someone would say, hey, brother, how you doing? You say, blessed. If you'd be honest, you'd probably say, man, I'm going through one of the hardest times in my life. Some of us. And when we get to that place, we can't play church anymore. Because I'm not here for a social meeting. I'm here so we can get touched by the power of God and be the next Willow, be the next Alicia, be the next Brittany, the next Allen. And we can be that. Every single one of us can be stirred up for the things of Christ, man. The, the, the church was strategically built upon the threshing floor. Yeah, that's right. I want you to hear that right now. The threshing floor was this big round area that had rocks. They had a big, huge, about the size of a door right here. And imagine drilling thousands of holes, hundreds of holes in this door about the size of golf balls. And then this big oxen would, would get that thing and it would it would pull it around in circles and that wheat was there and it would it would just 
crush it. It would, it would just destroy it and roll it around. And then they would throw it up in the air and it separated the real from the fake. Y'all with me? The wheat and the tear looked the same. The way that you knew what was real and what was fake was by going to the threshing floor. The, the, the church was strategically built upon a threshing floor. This should be a place where we're coming into the house of God and we're getting convicted. We're getting ground up, man, and it's separating the real from the fake. It's changing. It's molding. It's cutting the things off that don't need to be there. Hebrews 4 says this, the word of God is living and it's powerful and it's sharper than any two-edged sword. It cuts between joint and marrow and soul and spirit is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of man. Right? So when you think about that word right there, it's living, it's powerful, it's sharp. So the real gets separated from the fake. When you cry out to Jesus, man, Jesus rides on these clouds, man. When we fast and we pray, we can sing a triumphant song. There's smoke, the chapter says. And again, when Jesus came on the scene, that smoke disappeared. Jesus rides in on the clouds and, and he tells us he's going to come back. And he's going to come back just like he went on the clouds. Jesus. Man, and he's going to be known all over the world. And the same Holy Spirit is right here that was right there because we have this heavenly host that's around our city. You know, as I pray, I used to pray this way. God, you had these angels in the Garden of Eden. They were huge. They had fiery swords. And they stood and protected. Lord, I need you to stand around my church, the body of Christ. When I say my church, I'm talking about all of us. The body of Christ, not my church, your church. I don't care what brand's over the door. Amen. I care about the body of Christ. And God's word says he's coming after the church. Without spot, wrinkle, or blemish, man. And when I when I when I when I focus on that and I say, God, you have this heavenly host that's around my city, my strongholds, my struggles begin to get smaller and smaller. It's easy for me to take a back seat. And if Dave says, Brother, I got a word to share, I don't have to preach the word. I want God to move. I want God to move in our lives. I want this, this, this heavenly host to touch us this morning and throughout this week and throughout this generation and throughout this month, man. Why do we go places and want to leave? There's so many places that we go to and people say, man, why would you come here? I had, I had a lady from, from um, man, she was from overseas somewhere. She looked like a, a big Viking. Um, Everyone's big to me, but she wasn't, like it. she wasn't from here. She didn't know what ketchup was or nothing. It was weird, man. But she came over and she came to my office and, and she began to talk to me and she said, aren't you devastated that you moved here? You went from one of the, the, the number one ministries in the nation, having an office that was as big as half the stage, looked out over the Appalachian Mountains, man. You could see bear and deer and turkeys every day. And, the, you know, the, the fog that would come in amongst the mountains. It was beautiful. I stood one day in a church service and I said, Lord, if you want me to go to the deepest, darkest jungles of Africa, I'll go. And he said, nah, I got one better. I'm going to send you to East Liverpool. <laughs> <laughs> I said, man, I didn't say that. I said, the jungle. <laughs> he said, I got one better. And I came here and people would say this. Aren't you sad that you moved here? I said, no. Why does everybody want to leave? God's calling me here. He's called the family here. He's called this church to be strategically placed yeah. right here. This building with chairs and seats that aren't meant to be empty. When the Holy Spirit laid it on hearts to build this church, God did it for a reason and a purpose. Yes. But we get off track sometimes and, and people get discouraged and they want to leave and they want to quit at times. The black cloud they see disappears when we take the army of the Lord with us. You ever meet someone, man, they just can't get out of it. And it's like that dark cloud zone, they get comfortable there. And it's because when, when you have the army of the Lord with you, that black cloud begins to go. There's no trying to figure it out, but you just trust in the triumph of the Lord's army. You trust in that, man. Confessions come. Yes, you hearing that? When the army of God comes and it moves, 
Confessions begin to come. People become people become like, like Isaiah when he got in the presence of God. Now listen, his mouth was his strong point. But he said, oh God, I'm a man of unclean lips. He didn't say my eyes are unclean, my ears, my hand. His, his strong point was his voice, was his words. And he said, God, I'm a man of unclean lips. When, when, when a great move of God happens, when, when a reviving happens, when a transformation happens, people begin to confess before God and to one another. And they begin to change, man. Unity begins to come. Unity begins to come. And the spirit bears witness with your spirit that we're the children of God. That's what matters. Right? That's what matters. I don't care if, if your hair was fixed right. I don't care if you know all the Bible. I don't care if you're a theologian or not. I need to know that you're saved and you're pursuing Christ. Yeah. That you're being transparent. That you're being real. If these girls and these guys aren't real, I can't do nothing with them. Any advice that I give, scrap it. If it's not real and transparent, so confessions come, unity comes, bitterness goes, drug addiction goes, and it's replaced with triumph. Jesus, give us triumph. The Bible says that he is coming on a highway. Isaiah 40, verse 3 says, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert the highway for our God. Praise and shouting. Your triumphant war cry is the highway that brings the host of heaven to darkness. Your war cry, man. You're, you're crying out to the Lord in triumph. Even if you don't see it, even if you don't feel it, you know it's there. Because it's the word of God and it's true. And so when I come with that with that triumphant cry, when I come rejoicing, man, it's the highway. It's preparing the way for the Lord. It's making way for our God. Yes. Jesus. I believe that's why God started to move in here this morning. And we felt the presence of the Lord so strongly. Because we were making, we were preparing the highway of the Lord. And making a direct place for him to come down in here and to move in our lives. Amen. When we come in here and we say, God, we're going to sing a triumphant song. In the midst of tears. In the midst of stress. In the midst of, in the midst of confusion sometimes. And not having all the answers. I'm going to come in here and I'm going to sing with a triumphant cry. With the voice of with the voice of triumph I'm going to shout Amen. and literally man it opens up the heavens and it gets a direct highway right to us and God starts to move in a mighty way man God is risen listen God is risen and he's going to scatter his enemies you either believe that or you don't Hallelujah. you're either fired up for the things of God or you're not but that's going to happen whether you believe it or not, man. Because I know there's more than two people in this room that are believing for that to happen, man. And when we believe that, God moves. God has heard your cry. Amen. Or he hasn't. Which one do you believe? God has heard your cry. We're not to sit around worrying about world conditions or thinking the devil is winning, man. The Bible says that it's God. It's doing a supernatural shaking in Amos 9.9. 9. It's God who's doing the shaking. But it says not one true kernel will fall through. He's doing it for the reason of getting the garbage out. Yeah. So when, I, when I'm triumphant and I say, God, it feels like I'm in a box and I'm bouncing all around. But you're the one doing it and I thank you for it, God. And we're transparent, man. God can move, man. Some are in the condition or in that condition. And problems feel like there wherever you go, there's problems, there's issues, there's struggles, man. But there is something that can happen when you realize this truth and shout your victory cry. Amen. Some of us need to get our victory cry back. Some of us need to get our, our shouting voice back. Some of us need to say, God, I'm not to walk in defeat. I'm not to walk in, in discouragement. I'm to walk with my victory cry and shouting to God, man. There is a host that is ready to go to war in verses 7 and 8. There is a host that is ready to go to war. Right now, prepared, locked and loaded, ready to be set free, ready to come down here and fight our battles. But I have to come saying, God, because I know who you are and who this army is, I'm rejoicing already even if I don't see it. God, I'm rejoicing right now because revival is going to take place in this church. You may not see it. 
I'm rejoicing already, triumphantly singing. There's going to be drug addicts. There's going to be drug dealers. There's going to be marriages that were broken, get fixed. And people are going to walk through those doors and say, you know what? I don't know what's going on here. But man, does it feel good. Man, does this sound good. Man, because you can't get ahead in the world. You're set up for defeat out there, man. But when you come to Christ and you have him, this posture of victory, man, God begins to let you experience it because there's a host that's ready to go to war. They were with Moses on Mount Sinai. When he cried out to God and he praised him and he put his head between his knees and he said, God, I give you glory. I praise you, God. You're mighty. You're good. I'm, vict I'm outnumbered 450 to 1. But you're good. I, 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 I see a victory, God. I see a victory, God. Man, and he, he was able to go and he won that battle. And we know that story. And, 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 and where they are, where that host is, there's a showing of God's power. Hear me. Again, this is why I'm saying I don't want to play church. Where the host is, there's a showing of God's power. There's a physical manifestation of the presence of God that touches a life. I remember times in my in, in, in my walk with God, man, there was a little church down in Virginia, in, in Peterstown, Virginia, I think it was. Man, we were singing in this little church, and they were singing, I exalt thee. I remember I was like, I don't even know what exalt means, really. And I'm singing this song, I don't even know what the words mean. And I looked it up real quick, because I'm not the brightest. I was like, I want to know what I'm singing. I begin to I begin to, to to look that up, and it said to move him to the to the top of your list, to move him to number one. And I said, God, is my fears number one? Is my anxiety number one? Is my is my worry number one? Or are you number one? And I remember I started to believe that God was going to move mightily, and I was running sound, and I made my way up to an altar. Nobody touched me. Nothing happened. I fell out in the spirit, man, right in the altar. And I remember laying there, and when I woke up, the whole church was empty. Everybody was gone. It was just me, and I'm bald. It was just, well, there was one guy sitting about where, where Pastor Chuck sitting, and he was going, touch my buddy. Touch my buddy. He was weeping as I, lay. I laid there for hours. And I walked out of there, and I said, you know what? This is what happened to me. I was beaten down a little bit. I was lonely. I was single at the time. I was traveling around in ministry, man, and I would drive home by myself all the times and, and be sad and be depressed. I just seen people healed and set free and the people get out of wheelchairs and saw all this mighty stuff happen. And I would go home and I would weep at times, man. I'd be lonely and I'd struggle and I laid in this church and I remember getting up and, and literally what I did was start to praise God. And it opened up heaven, and this host of heaven came down into the room where I was at, and I was touched. Was everybody else touched? I don't know. They left. <laughs> but I know that I was. There was a physical manifestation of the presence of God that changed my life. It's made me who I am today, and I remember it because the host of heaven came down. On that mountain where Elijah was, there was a shaking of the whole mountain. There was lightning. There, the, 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 that host was at war. That host was at war. There was a battle that was going on, man. The wicked forces will perish at the presence of God. So there's a war that's going on. And, and nations can be changed. But there has to be a triumphant rejoicing before we see it or before we ever experience it, man. God heard my parents cry. I'm laying in this hospital bed and, and they're having to get me up and, and help me use the bathroom. And, and there was a host of heaven. My mom and dad came to church and they, they hid it for so long. And they stood up in church and they said, through crying and through bawling. Our son's a heroin addict. He's messed up. He's going to jail. He's looking at prison until he was an old man. And they started to share about all this stuff. But here's what happened in the church. Man, they started singing that song, not literally, but this is the posture they took. I see a victory. I see a victory in Jock. I see something that can change in him. I see something that's worth loving. I see somebody that's worth forgiving. And that host, that heavenly host, began to fight for me. Man, I remember I walked up to an altar and people were praying for me. I didn't feel nothing. I didn't see nothing. But I just knew, man, that there was a love present in that room. And I wanted it. They started to chip away at this hardness of heart, man. But as they stood up and was transparent to the church and said, we need to pray. 
And that host came fighting on my behalf. Praise God for a people. Praise God for a church. Because I would be dead right now. I woke up in stairwells dead and raw. I woke up getting Narcan. I woke up, man, with everything gone, not knowing where I am. Out in the middle of a woods, lying in the back of my truck, have no clue who I got there. But there was a heavenly host that was crying out for me and people were saying, man, there's victory. My pap, there was an old school Pentecostal preacher, was saying, son, don't be afraid to get out of the boat. Don't be afraid to get out of the boat. God, if you, if you say God speaks to you, get out of, that, out of that hospital bed and walk. I never went to physical therapy a day in my life. I was able to get up out of that hospital bed and I walked, man. But I took it for granted that this heavenly host was fighting on my behalf. And problems came back in. And struggles of life came back in. And I became worse than I ever was. But praise God for a church Amen. that continued to pray for this heavenly host to fight on my behalf. And they continued to pray. Man, and there was a triumphant rejoicing before they ever seen it. But God heard that cry. And one day he said, it's enough, Satan. Amen. It's enough. Amen. Take your hands off him. That's my child. I'm going to redeem him. I'm going to set him free. I'm going to put a fire in him. I'm going to set him ablaze with the Holy Ghost, man. I'm gonna let him. I'm gonna let him have this dumb faith where I just believe it to be true. Amen. I'm gonna do a work through him. And praise God for that man. God heard that cry. We have to go to him. We have to go to him, and we have to believe God for it, man. We have to have a triumphant faith. We have to have a faith that is contagious, that is triumphant, man. And this time, we have to hold on. We have to trust that he's going to scatter these enemies. Yes. There's things coming against the body, against the church. Satan wants nothing more than to cause discord and disunity in the house of God. That's what he wants. But we have to begin to pray for one another. We're the only army that shoot our wounded. I work with Navy SEALs and I work with other people. And, and they've told me stories of going out to rescue their friends that had already passed. They were already gone. But they said we have such a respect for them. We don't leave them here. We, we want to make sure they, have a, they get to go home and have a burial with their family. And I said, you go out and you got him. And he was already passed away. You put yourself in, in the line of fire to save your friend just to get his body. He said, absolutely, and I would do it again. I said, wow, does the church need to learn from that? Wow, does the church need to hear that? Why are we the only army that shoot our wounded? Instead, we should be praying that heavenly host around our pastors, around our leaders, around our elders, around our board members, around our Sunday school teachers, around our music ministry. We should pray that when they get up here and they begin to sing and praise God, that we're rejoicing and they're leading us and they're leading the heavens opening up in a, in a highway and coming down into this room and transforming our lives. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus. Man, he, he's gonna scatter his he's gonna scatter our enemies. This 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 smoke screen that Satan puts in front of us is gonna be blown away. Yes. When I was down at Team Challenge, I heard so many times about people walking onto the campus and, and they begin to tremble. They would literally begin to tremble under the presence of God. You know, I, I've heard people say when I come on that Freedom Home property, there's just a peace here. There's something here because there's a constant rejoicing. There's a constant crying out for the host of heaven to fight on our behalf. Amen. And we see it happen. There's a manifestation that takes place, man. There's something that begins to change and the Holy Ghost falls and people fall under conviction and then they begin to fight. I want to encourage us this morning to fall under that, that same conviction, that same holy presence, that same thing that we're saying, God, I praise you because I want this heavenly host to fight for me, to fight for the people next to me, to fight for the leaders, to fight for everyone. We need it to fight, God. Because we're tired of being a defeated people, man. We got to get to a place where we want God to arise in us. We got to get to a place where we're giving him some triumphant praise. We have to get to that place. And when we get right there, man, and we can say, God, you're arising. The enemies are being scattered. It starts to become a present tense because it's happening right now. It's happening right now. Would you mind to come up and just play something soft? Because it's happening 
right now. And I want us just for a few minutes, man, to close our eyes and get our focus on Jesus for a minute. I want us to close our eyes and begin to open up heavens with our praise. Man, I want, if you're here this morning and you're saying, Josh, I'm here and I've been that one. I'm in church, but I've not been coming down to the altar. I know there's things in my life that need to be dealt with. I know I need to get into the presence of God and just begin to praise. I know I need to open up heaven and have that host that fight for my family members, that fight for my brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen. This is an opportunity to open up the windows of heaven and let him pour down in here. Jesus. Jesus. Hallelujah. I don't know if you know Jesus this morning or not. I don't know your relationship with him. He loves you. He loves you enough to reach his mighty hand down and pick you up. And it says that he upholds us in his righteous right hand. That means victory. A right hand means victory. He upholds us in his righteous right hand. Church, we got to get to where he's at. We got to crawl up in his hand like my kids do me as dad. When I come home and I don't see him for a while, they crawl up in my lap and I love it. God said, I want you to call up in my life. Let me uphold you in my victorious right hand. Let me lift you up to a place of victory. But you can't do it without me. You can't do it without me. Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. And you're here this morning and you say, Josh, I don't know Jesus is my personal savior. All this sounds good, all this sounds amazing, but, but I don't have this relationship where I can cry out to God. I don't have this this morning, or, or maybe you did it one time, and, and you walked away from the Lord, man, and you just lost that excitement. You've lost that passion. You've lost the belief that God can do a miracle in and around you. That's you this morning, and we want to pray with you. We want to believe God for you to walk all the way back to the throne room into his presence because where his presence is there's a change there's peace there's victory Jesus church let's pray this morning God I come to you right now Lord and, 